Good afternoon. Welcome back. We are still at uh, Galatians chapter 4. The last time we ended, uh, it was Paul exhorting the people to follow him. Brethren, verse 12, right? Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. He was urging them to be like him, to have the freedom in Christ. And he said he wasn't offended at all by what they have done, probably because they did it out of ignorance. So you have not injured me at all. So today, with the rest of the uh, chapter before us, God willing, I hope to complete this in the one hour. So Father, once again, we come to you thanking you for this opportunity to study your word. Thank you, Lord, for all that we have gleaned from your word all these weeks. And it's because your Holy Spirit has been with us to enlighten our hearts and our minds. And we ask for the same, even this afternoon, in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you look at the outline, we are still on the second segment of this chapter 4. And that is fears for the church. Paul was indeed having concerns for the church because they had been deceived by the Judaizers. So I've got uh, a bit more to cover in this section from verse 8 to verse 20. So let's look now at verse 13. And he said, or he wrote, You know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. Now what does it mean? And because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. Now, those days, he was travel, traveling in the area or in the region of Galatia. And probably he contracted some kind of illness during the trip. And malaria was quite common. So it could be an illness like malaria that caused him not to progress further in his journey, but he had to stop and he stopped at this place in Galatia to seek medical attention or to rest. But then again, we do not know if it is malaria because some speculated it could be an eye problem. We don't know. But there are verses uh, and even those following that supported this the, uh, uh, possibility that it was an eye problem. So let's read on. So you know that because of inf of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And verse 14, And my trial, which was in my flesh, did, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. And my trial, what trial is this? Is this a trial before the judges in the courts? No, this was his illness experience. It is a trial. It, it, it is a, a, a painful journey. It was a painful experience. It was an illness experience and it was probably unpleasant. And so at my trial, which was in my flesh, he was suffering in the flesh. He wasn't suffering in the spirit. You did not despise nor reject. So they, the, the people at Galatia, they were hospitable. They, re, they received Paul even as he came with the infirmity, with the illness. And they did not despise him or rejected him. And in fact, the way they received him, they treated him as if he was an angel of God. He was sent from on high. And they gave him a reception that was almost equivalent to the ultimate and what could be the ultimate reception? The reception of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you receive me, you did not reject me. Oh, you are sick looking, we do not know you, you are stranger, please go away. No, they receive him as an angel of God, even as Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. So they treated him, him very well. Verse 15. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? So remember, when you first received me, you received me with open arms and you were so warm. So what was the reason? 
Why, why did you extend that, that uh, welcome to me? What then was the blessing you enjoyed? You, you must have been blessed. You must have enjoyed some moments. So what then? Then it was really great. It was really warm. But why is it now you, you are a bit cold? Why? Is it because you have heard the wrong things? You have been deceived by the Judaizers and, and now you are a bit cold towards uh, Paul, towards me. And I remember, Paul was saying, I remember you were even willing to pluck out your own eyes to give it to me. So, historians, scholars, they assume, or they presume from here, that uh, possibly Paul had an eye problem. And these people in Galatia, you know, out of empathy and love for Paul, they say, oh, if only we can you know, exchange our eyes with you because you are an angel from God. You, you have brought us good news. For I bear you witness that if possible, of course it wasn't possible, but if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So if you look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Galatians 6, verse 11 which is two chapters uh, away, but here it was recorded by Paul that in the final chapter of this book, he took the pen and in his signing off, he wrote that conclusion in large letters. So verse 11, verse 11, he, he wrote in large letters. And Why? Possibly because uh, it was an aid to his vision. He could not do it any smaller. So, see what large letters I have written to you with my own handwriting. So, prior to this, as with all the other letters, he would have a secretary to pen down the words. But usually, towards the end of each epistle, each letter, he would sign off personally. And this time, he did so with large letters. I have written to you with my own hand. Why? Scholars believe that it is because his eyes were weak and they were not doing very well. And, so probably, and that's why he needed large letters in his writing for his own benefit. So let's go back to uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 15. So, Again, we don't want to speculate. It could be malaria. It could be an eye problem. But the key thing here is, what is it that had taken place for you to do a U-turn in your relationship with me, in how you receive me? Now, I find that you are uh, not, not so warm, not so loving as you were when I first visited you. For I bear witness, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Verse 16, Have I therefore become your enemy, enemy because I tell you the truth? Have I now become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And if I tell you the truth, and now you change your, your position, your, your, your attitude towards me, then it is because someone else must have tell you something different from the truth. And what is this? This is the lie from the Judaizers because they added something else to the truth. They added the law to grace, which is wrong, which is not right. So he said, Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And of course, we know it by now. I've repeated this uh, enough for you uh, to, to, to bear it in your mind that the Judaizers had been going around after Paul had left the ministry uh, area and they went about undermining Paul's ministry. Now, let me tell you, Paul was trying to win these people for Christ. Paul was trying to win all these pre-believers, all these Galatians and others wherever he went. He was trying to win them for Christ. But what were the Judaizers doing? They were trying to win, win, W-E-A-N, win them from Christ. And that is so, so wrong. And so they had been deceived. And so that explains the cold 
uh, 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 treatment or attitude towards Paul at this point in time. And Paul is not one guy who let the matter off so easily and then he went on strong again in verse 17. They, they zealously caught you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. So who are the they? Judaizers. The Judaizers, they are so zealous, they come and they bombard you with love. So in uh, the ministry, there is this thing known as love bombing. Love bombing. So they bomb you with love, you know. Wow, they shower you with love and, and care for you and keep in touch with you, fellowship with you. And that's what they did. Now, if they did it for a good reason, fine. They did it with a good motive, fine. But even as they caught you, like you caught your girlfriend or your boyfriend, okay, either way, <laughs> but for no good, they had a different motive. What is their motive? They want to exclude you. They want, the Judaizers wanted to exclude the Galatians from what? From the truth. They wanted to exclude Judaizers from Paul's ministry, from Paul and his team, from Paul's teaching. Anything and everything to do with Paul and of course, this, this means the truth because Paul was preaching the truth. And in short, from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, they did bomb you with love because they want to exclude you from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because they want to drag you into works, even through the law, that you may be zealous for them. Now, Paul used the resources to build the church, which is the people. But this Judaizers used the people to build their own position, their own uh, assets, their own uh, uh, authority. And that is wrong. So, they did it for themselves. Verse 18, but it is... Good to be zealous in a good thing always and not only when I am present with you. And it is good to be zealous, to have that passion, to have the enthusiasm. Enthusiasm means God within, right? And it's good in a good thing. If you are zealous in reaching out to your community, evangelism, that is good. If you are zealous in, in ministering to the needs of the needy, that is good. If you are zealous in teaching the word, sharing the word with others, that is good. You are zealous in preaching or in praying, that is good. But don't do it only when I'm around. Just be consistent and whatever you are zealous in, the good thing, do it consistently. Not only when I am present with you, just to showcase to me. What for? You, you are just having like a hypocrite, you know, having a facade and just for display only. Verse 19. Now, before verse 19, since we are talking about Judaizers and, and, and their bad motives, uh, there is Proverbs 27 verse 6. That perhaps it is a good reminder for, for us. You know, Proverbs 27 verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Paul was a friend to the Galatians. And sometimes his words do hurt. But it was meant to be well, so that they will correct themselves and be able to grow and to mature in Christ. But the kisses of an enemy who comes, you know, uh, stroke your back, put whisper nice things into your ears, and even if you are approaching a pit hole, you will not be worn and you may fall. So the kisses of an enemy, they are deceitful. And such were the Judaizers. So now we move on to verse 19. My little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. So when he said, my little children, he was taking the role of a spiritual father. Indeed, he was. 
He brought them, he brought them into the family of God. So he was a spiritual parent to this newborn babies, spiritual, spiritual children of his. And, and he wasn't the first. Uh, there was also the Apostle John. Apostle John in his letters, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, he also used in his old age, he wrote, my little children. So he was taking the position, not as the biological father, but as a spiritual father. My little children for whom I labor in birth again. So, just now was spiritual father, my little children, but now when he said, I labor. Now, who goes into labor? The mother, right? So he's taking on that role. And he's very good in metaphor. You know, I'm a runner, Olympic, I'm a boxer, I'm an athlete, I'm a farmer. Because this kind of metaphors will help the lay people to understand the, the message better. It, you are bringing your... your, your language down to their level for their understanding. So he said, my little children, so oh, spiritual father, but now he, he, he brought on this, the mother. Because only the mother will uh, experience labor in the delivery of a child. So, but he had been in labor for them once. And when was that? When he first came and he shared the gospel with them and they accepted Christ. Through Paul's ministry, they were birthed into the kingdom of God. They were born into the kingdom of God, the spiritual birth. That was the first time when Paul visited Galatia. And now that he has gone away, and then he found out that the Judaizers came in and corrupted what he had done, and leading these people away from the grace of God. So Paul is saying, and now have I got to come and do it all over again to give birth to you again into the kingdom of God. That's what he was saying. So, my little children for whom I labor in birth again. So, looks like I have to come to you again to give you another born again experience. That's what he means. Until Christ is formed in you. Until Christ is formed in you. It means what? It refers to spiritual maturity. Now, the moment, the moment you have received Christ into your life, Christ is in there. But now you have been deceived and you, you are wanting to move away from the truth. I got to do this again until you are matured in Christ again until Christ is formed in you. Verse 20, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Now, we all know this huh? from uh, uh, earlier epistles. Paul, when he writes, uh, when he sends his letters, uh, he is very strong. And even in Corinthians, when we studied and so on, and it was always said of him, no? Paul, when you write, uh, your letters are always very strong, very stern. But when you come, uh, you look so much like a weakling. You, you are, you know, short, not the most handsome, not strong, not big, yeah, bow-legged, uh, long, sharp. No? In, in, in other words, you, your, your presence is not impressive. You remember? We, 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 we have come across this in, in the other epistles. But Paul, your letters are, wow, they really cut to the skin. You, you really uh, uh, take us to task and you really challenge us and, and rebuke us and, and while, while you also exhort us. So Paul is saying, I would like to be present with you now. That means to visit Galatia again and to change my tone because my tone now as I write, I'm very Stern, I'm very angry. So I want to mellow down when I come to you because I have concerns about you. I have concerns about your faith. I have doubts about you. But when I come, when I come, I will correct this. But now 
I seem to be very stern and angry. But when I come, I hope to change my tone and help you yeah, to, to adjust your bearing again. Calibrate your bearing again back into alignment with Christ, in Christ, by faith alone. So, with that, we finish the second um, part of Galatians chapter 4. We started with sons and heirs from verse 1 to 7. And then from verse 8 to 20, uh, we looked at the concerns that Paul had for the church. Now, we come to the last segment of this uh, chapter 4, and that is about two covenants. Again, Paul assumed they know the Scriptures. And Paul wanted to bring the Scriptures to the forefront to tell them, what he is sharing with them and what he had taught, taught them is not something out of the blue. These are all in accordance with the Word of God and with the Word of God spoken in the past and through the lives of their patriarchs. And this patriarch in, is in the person of Abraham. And God worked through him. Yeah? So he brought this, brought this to mind and to tell them about the two covenants. So we look at verse 21 to verse 31. So let's read verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? You who desire to be under the law, who was he talking to? He was addressing these people who had been influenced by the Judaizers. You are already saved by grace, but now you want to add the law to this. That means you want to go back to the law. Okay, fine. You who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Do you not know the requirements of the law? Now, those days, uh, not everyone has a written Bible. Not everyone has the written scriptures because they are expensive. Because they were all handwritten, they, there wasn't any publishing company, you can just go to a bookstore and, and, and just buy a Bible. So most of the time when they gather, when they congregate, they will be hearing the word. They'll be hearing the law. So do you not hear the law? Hear what? The law, the law actually tells you you're a sinner. The law points you to condemnation. The law condemns you. Do you hear that or not? And the law tells you the penalty. If you don't do this, you will get this. If you do this, you get this. Basically, if you obey, there will be blessings. But if you don't obey, there will be curses. Now, with all the requirements of the law, moral and the ceremonial and the dietary, how many people can meet all the requirements of the law. No. No, not one. Now, that means if you don't meet all the requirements of the law, because even a single f uh, uh, infringement of a law, you, the whole thing is against you. You are a sinner. That means there are penalties. And the wage of a sinner is death. There will be penalties. So do you hear, is that what you want? Is that what you want? Because on your own, by your own effort, you will never attain to the full requirements of the law. But you want to be under the law, right? So do you not hear the law? The law tells you you are unrighteous. That you will never meet the requirements of the law. Verse 22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one by a born woman, and the other by a free woman. And again, I say that Paul assumed they know the Scriptures. Okay? So they would know there was Abraham, and then Abraham had Sarah. But prior to Sarah giving birth to Isaac, Abraham the, and his wife, Sarah, decided to give God a helping hand because it seemed like God was delaying on his promise. He promised Abraham that, you know, you shall be with child and through you many families in this 
or uh, in this world shall be blessed. But as they were approaching uh, the age of 86, 80 something, Sarah was still not pregnant. So they thought they should help God. And so Sarah suggested to Abraham, maybe you should go and sleep with Hagar, the maid. And he did. And this was in the flesh. This wasn't directed by God. And this was done in the flesh. And out of this relationship came Ishmael. And so there was this son, Ishmael, who was first born to Abraham. And he was born by a born woman in bondage. And that was Sarah. No, I mean, that was Hagar. Hagar was a slave girl. Then you have the other one. Who is the other one? Isaac. Isaac by a free woman, Sarah. Now, before we proceed any further, let me show you the timeline, timeline of uh, this Abraham's life. So just catching him at the age of 75. Abraham at the age of 75, God appeared to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And God called Abraham, come out of the land of the Chaldeans, out of Ur, the land of Chaldeans. Come out. Yeah? And Abraham did. God made him three promises. Yeah? Uh, there will be a land for you. Yeah? There will be, uh, um, what was that? Uh, through you, all the nations of the world shall be blessed. And he will give them a people. So God appeared to Abraham in Genesis 12 at the age of 75. At the age of 80, God appeared again to Abraham in Genesis 15. And if you remember Genesis 15, we have covered this a few times. God made a covenant with Abraham, promising him, because in, in Genesis chapter 15, I think verse 3, 4 or something, yeah, Abraham said, you know, to God, you, you, you have given me no offspring. You promised, but you have given me no offspring. And he was getting on in age. So God took him out and said, look at the stars. As many as the stars are, so shall your offsprings be. And that was the promise. The other one was, you see, from the river now in Egypt all the way to the river Euphrates up in the north, this uh, is the, the land, the promised land for your people. And that was uh, what happened in Genesis 15. So God appeared again to Abraham at age 85. Sarah had idea for Abraham to father a child with Hagar because it's taking too long. It's not going to happen. Her factory has already closed down. You know, and Abraham is probably weak at the age of 85. Now, it tells you one thing. Sarah's womb was dead. Sarah's womb was like a tomb. But at the age of 90, when she gave birth to Isaac, from the tomb of death came life. You follow me? That's resurrection. So, at age 85, Sarah had an idea to help God. And so, Hagar go and sleep with the master Abraham. And then at age 86, Ishmael was born. Finally, at age 100. Age 86, that was the work of the flesh. But age 100, by the promise according to the work of the Spirit, age 100, Isaac was born. When man cannot, God will show he can. When Abraham is weak and, and Sarah's uh, 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 womb is dead, that's when God will show that he is the one, he can. So Isaac was born. So, we read on back to uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 24. Let me read from verse 23. Uh, he, but he who was of the born woman 
was born according to the... Wait, wait, sorry. Let me read 21, okay? Just for me to flow well. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a born woman, and this is a picture of the law, and the other, Isaac, by a free woman, that is Sarah, a, the picture of grace. Verse 23, But he who was of the born woman, who is this? Ishmael. He was born according to the flesh, which I just explained to you according to the table, the timeline. And he of the free woman, and this is Isaac, through promise. And this was Isaac, born to Abraham when he was 100, and Sarah was 90 years old. Verse 24, which things are symbolic. So these are symbolic. And this is painting a picture. Yeah? One is of the flesh and one is through the promise. For these two, these two are, these are the two covenants. That is the agreement. That is like the contract. For these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this is Hagar, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now, let me unpack this for you because it is a mouthful. So he mentioned about, Sarah, about Hagar yeah, with uh, Ishmael and Sarah with Isaac. And he said, these are two covenants, symbolic. So he explains now, for these are, these are the two covenants. The one, so we look at the first covenant. The first covenant, which was at Mount Sinai. And what happened at Mount Sinai? It was the giving of the law from God to Moses. Now this took place, mind you, this took place 1,500 years no, uh, took place sometime after many years after Abraham received or, or had the covenant made with God in Genesis 15. You follow me? It was in Genesis 15 many years ago that God made the covenant with Abraham and it wasn't, it wasn't by Law. It was grace. It wasn't by Abraham's work. Abraham did not do anything in order to deserve this. It was purely by grace. And Abraham believed what God said. You shall be with child. Yes, Lord. As many as the stars in the sky, you will have that many offspring. Yes, Lord. I'm going to give you all this land. Yes, Lord. What had Abraham done to deserve this? Nothing. It was purely by grace. It was him who believed this by faith and it was counted unto him as righteousness. And he was saved. He did all this by no effort of his, but by faith he believed and he was counted to him as righteous. Righteous, that means what? Forgiven. Then now, years later, at Mount Sinai, at Mount Sinai, now Moses received the law. So the law came later. And verse 24, the one from Mount Sinai which gives birth to bondage. Because it was the law and the law condemns you. The law tells you you are a sinner. To let you know. Otherwise you wouldn't know. To let you know you are a sinner. That means you are in bondage to sin. That means you 
are doing things that are not pleasing to God. You fall short of the expectations and the requirements of God. You are in bondage to sin. So, the one from Mount Sinai, which is the law, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Hagar was a slave woman, was a slave girl to the, her employers. Who were employers? Abraham and Sarah, which is Hagar. For this is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. For this Hagar, Hagar actually means rock. Okay? But again, we are talking about symbolic. Symbolic, that means this Hagar, it, we are not talking about the person Hagar, but this Hagar represents the law. This Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. So, what Paul is saying that this Hagar, which is the law, was given at Mount Sinai in Arabia. You follow me? And corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is. Which now is, that means when Paul was writing this letter, when Paul was writing this letter, Jerusalem was already there. Which now is, that means what? The law which was given to Moses at Mount Sinai, the same law is now being practiced and preserved and worshipped even now in Jerusalem from Jerusalem. Because the people there, the Jews there, the Judaizers, the, the Pharisees, the, 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 the priests and all the religious people, they were worshipping the law. They were worshipping the rules, the regulations and the rituals. And that's what they did. They were worshipping the temple, which that law, first given in Mount Sinai, also considered symbolically as Hagar. Okay? That one is now in Jerusalem, where the people, are, the religious people, are worshipping that. This law, practicing this law, keeping this law, even now, as Paul was writing this letter, even now in Jerusalem, and is in bondage with her children. It's about legalism, being legalistic. So this, I know I'm repeating, but I think if you, you know, are still lost, I hope you you will capture it this time. Okay. Hagar, which is the law, representing the law, it was given in Mount Sinai. Yeah? And now it has been transported to, because they didn't remain in, 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 uh, in, in the wilderness in Saudi Arabia, it has been transported now to Jerusalem. And it is in Jerusalem, which is, like the, which is the, the capital for this Judaism. That's, that's the center now. And the people there are worshipping and practicing and keeping and observing strictly the law. And this put people in bondage. It is legalism. Do's and the don'ts and the penalties and things related. And is in bondage with her children. I hope you are following. Okay? But, but, so, but that means it is something in reverse, something contrasting, something which is not the same. It is the opposite. So, what Paul in the last two verses is saying is about the earthly Jerusalem. At the, Paul, at the point in time when Paul was writing this, the earthly Jerusalem, they are worshipping the law. They are worshipping the temple. They are worshipping all the rituals. But, but, the Jerusalem above is free. The Jerusalem of God in heaven is free. Not bondage, free from bondage. That's why Jesus said, and when the truth sets you free, you are free indeed. We, we are free. With the truth, we are free. And these people of Galatia, they were given the truth. And they were free at least for a while, until the Judaizers came and dragged them back to the practices as they were 
in Jerusalem and now they are in bondage again. But the Jerusalem, because this world is not our home, ultimately, we want to be there. But the Jerusalem above is free, free from bondage, which is the mother of us all, which is the ultimate, you follow me? Like when they went to the desert storm war, they said the mother of all war, you know, any disaster, they said the mother, is, it means it is the ultimate. So the best, the ultimate Jerusalem is the one above, not the one here physically. And if you look at Revelation 21, Revelation 21 verse 1 and 2, and Revelation is the last book of the Bible and and by the time we read, uh, we, read uh, we come to Revelation 21, Satan has been defeated, the dragon has been defeated, all those enemies of God have been thrown into the lake of fire. And then you see, as Paul, as John wrote, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So it is, that means there is an old heaven and an old earth. Now you get a new heaven and a new earth. So I know right now we have the green movement, you know, uh, don't kill too much, don't cut down too many trees, don't burn too much, don't this, don't that. Of course, we do our best not to destroy this earth. We do our best not to corrupt this place, pollute this place. But this is not our ultimate home. Because ultimately, we will have a heavenly home. Because there will be a new heaven and there will be a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, that is what we are, where we are, had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. So you want to go for your cruise tour, better go now. Okay, next. Then I, John the Apostle, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem which is not the one on earth. This is the one from heaven, coming down out of heaven. From where? From none other than our God, the Father. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Beautiful, adorned with you know, beauty and, and ornaments, decorated, whatever. The, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, all I know is, I believe the word of God, we will come with him and we shall be beautiful. But the key thing I want to point to you is don't look at the holy city here now. In fact, if you go to Jerusalem now, you don't see the temple. It has been put down. Now all they have is the, the western wall and they are wailing over it. Right now, Mount Moriah, is, you, you, what you see most prominently is the golden dome and the mosque. But it's not the temple. And scholars said, you know why the temple was taken down, the walls were broken and so on? And, and what you see today are the ruins. You know why? Because God wanted them to take their eyes off the physical structure and to look at Him because they were worshipping all these temples and, and, and all these ornaments and so on, but they were, their hearts were not directed at Him. And the day shall come when the new Jerusalem shall come down out of heaven, which is the mother of us all, the ultimate Mount Zion in heaven, from heaven, coming down. So verse 27, Galatians 4 verse 27, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren. Now, this passage here is taken from Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54. But know that before Isaiah 54, there was Isaiah 53. There is, right? And what is Isaiah 53 about? It is about the suffering Savior. It is about Jesus Christ, yeah? Yeah, he was nailed to the cross and he was beaten and, and so on. So that is Isaiah 53 about the suffering Savior. Then come to Isaiah 54. Rejoice, O barren. Barren, that means you do not have child. You who do not bear. So, Sarah, don't be sad. Sarah, rejoice. 
break forth and shout. Because good times are coming. Times of rejoicing. Right now, you may not have. You look, wow, Hagar has got child. And I, Sarah, no child. I, I, I am barren. But the, 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 the slave girl is pregnant and with child. Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout. And still looking into the future, you who are not in labour, you who are not in labour yet, because at that point, when Sarah was looking at Hagar, she wasn't pregnant yet. And so likewise, right now, while we are here on this earth, Gentiles, you know, we all see, eh, we are not getting it. It's only the Jews, uh, they, they are the chosen people and they are getting it. Getting the good news, you know, they, they got the, 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 the law from God and, and Jesus Christ is, is uh, through them. You who are not in labor, for the desolate has many more children. For the desolate, referring to the Gentiles. For the desolate has many more children than he, than she who has a husband. Now, in the Old Testament, Israel, Israel, was considered as the wife of God. Okay? God is the husband and Israel is the wife. Now, so then she who has a husband, so this is pointing to Israel. Similarly, this is also uh, referring to the Gentiles. For the desolate has many more children. Tell me, today, uh, the church, the church of the world, the universal church across the whole earth, are there more Jews or more Gentiles? More Gentiles. This desolate, I mean, for a while, they were barren. We were barren. For a while, uh, we, we, we were not in labor. But now, but now, the church global has got many more members and we are turning our focus now back to Jerusalem to reach out to the Jews so that they too can be saved. You follow me? So, rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children. This is talking about the future and I tell you it has come to pass. It has come to pass, surely the desolate has got more children than she who has a husband. Verse 28. Now, before we go on to verse 28, I want you to look at this table, the old covenant and the new covenant. So if you look at this table, just so you can see the contrast, uh, you have Old Covenant, which is the law, and then you have the New Covenant, which is grace. And I've been uh, sharing with you the last half hour or so, Hagar, the slave. And then, in contrast, you have Sarah, the free woman. Ishmael, conceived after the flesh. Isaac, conceived miraculously, because it was at an age where both Abraham and Sarah were not able physically on their own. Old Covenant, we were looking at the earthly Jerusalem, as Paul mentioned, as it was then when he wrote the epistle. But praise God, in Revelation 21, we are promised the new heaven coming down, heavenly Jerusalem. In bondage, that is the key thing you see in the Old Covenant putting people in bondage. But in the new covenant, we have freedom in Christ. In the old covenant, they had all the legalistic things and all the laws and rules and regulation. But they were barren. They were really barren. But in the new covenant, it is grace. And this grace will bring about fruits 
fruits even in our labor, fruits even in our ministry, it, it will be, it is, not it will be, it is fruitful grace. So, now we go back to um, verse 28, Galatians chapter 4. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. So, now, Paul is bringing them back. Remember, we, we, we are followers of Jesus Christ, believers in Jesus Christ, we who are born again. As Isaac was, Isaac was a child of promise, which I just showed you in the table. We are also children of promise. We were delivered, we were born again miraculously because on our own, we could not. But by His grace, we are saved, not by works. You look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. And what is that? The Word of God. Through the Word of God which lives and abides forever. We are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the word, the living word, the true word, which is the word of God. And that is incorruptible. And this is a life. And it is a life forevermore. Lives and abides in us forever. So back to Galatians 4.29. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. And I tell you, it is still true today. Those who are born through the flesh, even today, are persecuting those of us who are born according to the Spirit. You open up the newspaper today, you see. You watch TV, you watch the news, you see. Those who are born of the Spirit are persecuted by those who are born of the flesh. Even so, it is now. Even so, it is now. So, as it was then, it is also now, presently happening. When Paul wrote this, it was 2,000 years ago. The persecution was already on. Now it is so. So, Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the born woman and her son, for the son of the born woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. That means this is not a suggestion. This is not a suggestion. You read this in Genesis. God told Abraham, cast out the born woman with her son, cast out Hagar and Ishmael. Yes, God will provide for them, but they cannot stay in the same household because they are a picture of the law. Yeah, So law and grace cannot mix. So cast out the, and it's a command, cast out the born woman, which is a picture of legalism of the law, and her son. Let me tell you, Ishmael at this point in time was about 17 years old. Because just now, we read, we read just now, uh, we saw just now at the table, Ishmael was born, Ishmael was born when uh, Abraham was 86 years old. It's recorded there. Isaac was born when? When he was 100 years old. One no, Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Ishmael, when he was born, Isaac, no, Ishmael, when he was born, Abraham was about 86 years old. So, there was a 14 year gap between Ishmael and Isaac. And then a few years later, after Isaac was born, when he was celebrating his uh, third birthday or whatever, and that's when he was mocked by Ishmael. And so it was time when the command had to be given for Ishmael 
and his mother, Hagar, to leave the household. So, Ishmael wasn't exactly a small kid, infant. So he was about 17 years old when he and his mother, Hagar, have had to leave the household. So cast them out for the son. And you know, when God said this, uh, God did not say, uh, uh, but we allow you some uh, occasional visits. No? Maybe once a year or once or twice a year, you can come, and come back and visit the household. No, no, no. Out means out. Because they cannot coexist. So, whatever the Judaizers told you, you can, you know, drag the law back, bring the law in. No, it is out to be separated. For the son of the born woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. They cannot coexist. Because rebellion, rebellion will come when you have got all these rules and regulations and then it will start... A, 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 a conflict. So we look at Genesis 21 verse 9. Genesis 21 verse 9. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. Scoffing at who? Scoffing at Isaac. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, and son of Hagar is Ishmael, the Egyptian slave girl whom she had born to Abraham, scoffing. And because Ishmael was scoffing at Isaac, that led to both of them having to leave the household. And again, I say, the scoffing is still going on today. The scoffing is still going on today. So verse 31, So then, brethren, we are not children of the born woman, but of the free. Because earlier on in the verse 28, we are like Isaac, children of the promise. We are like Isaac, children of the promise. And then, if we are like Isaac, then we are not children. We can't associate ourselves with the born woman, but with the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the born woman, but of the free. And I think last week also we covered, if you are of Christ, you are of Abraham's seed. Right? So they all are consistent that we are linked to Abraham. And we are not of the born woman, but we are of the free woman. Now, there are also a couple of uh, 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 slides I want to show you before we end the lesson today. So, this is about grace. So, just now I show you the old covenant, the law, and then I show you the new covenant, grace. But, so you have law, old covenant, then you have grace, new covenant. So, it seems like everything started with the law. No, everything did not start with the law. It all started with grace. So this grace, um, I have a slide for you. So God began with grace. So in his relation with Adam and Eve, they were in the garden with him. Even after they had sinned, in his grace, he provided them with coats of skins for a covering. You remember, we, we don't have time to turn to all the references, but I believe you know. They, Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they quickly went to hide, right? And then it was mentioned in the Bible, in Genesis 3.21, they covered themselves with skin. Now, to cover yourself with skin, that means the skin must have been taken from something, right? Some animal had to be killed. Then the skin was taken to cover. When you kill, that means that blood was shed, right? So without the shedding of blood, there's no covering of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin because your sin is to be covered. Your sin is to be forgiven. So, even after they sin. In His grace, He provided them with coats. Now, who provided? Who provided? Maybe I should show you. Genesis 3.21. Genesis 3.21. Also, for Adam and, and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. 
who provided the skin? God. And for God so loved the world that He sent His Son. Who provided? Who made, who made that provision for the forgiveness of our sins? God. It is nothing of our effort. It is by His grace He sent His Son. He demanded righteousness and He provided righteousness. And that righteousness is in the person of Jesus Christ. God provided. And what is that? That is grace. Adam and Eve did nothing to deserve this. In fact, they should be punished because they disobeyed God. But God provided the cover for them. Back to the, the slide, God began with grace. He did not give them laws to obey as a way of redemption. Do you read anywhere in Genesis that God gave them laws? No. It came much later at Mount Sinai and He gave to Moses, not to Adam and Eve. So it all started at the beginning with grace. He gave them a gracious promise to believe, the promise of a victorious Redeemer. And when was Jesus the Saviour first mentioned? It was in Genesis 3.15. You look at Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity. Now, this was after Abraham, no, after Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they came before God and this was the sentencing time, punishment time. God pronounced a, a, a punishment upon them. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So he was addressing this to the serpent. Yeah, I'm going to put enmity. That's why until today, the devil and us are no friends. We are no friends with the devil. And God will put enmity between the devil and the woman. Yeah, and between your seed and her seed. Her seed is one singular word, capital S. He will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, Bruise your head, you will die. You will lose. But bruise his heel, yeah, hurt him, and, and so hurt the body of Christ, whatever. But we know Jesus was hung on the cross. He died. But death could not take him. He overcame death. He shall bruise your head. So this in Genesis 15 pointed to none other than Jesus Christ. Because the serpent came into the garden and deceived Adam and Eve and brought about this disobedience. So he gave them a promise because you have sinned. How then can you come back to God? Because sin will separate you from God. And he provided this in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, the seed, S-E-E-D, capital. So, that was in relationship with Adam and Eve. He started with grace. And what about his relationship with Israel? In his covenant with Abraham, Genesis 15, his covenant with Abraham was all grace because Abraham was in a deep sleep when the covenant was established. Two weeks ago, I mentioned to you, you know, for them in the olden days uh, to seal a covenant, they would take an animal, sacrifice, and they split into half, one on the left and one, the carcass, the dead body. Half would be placed on one side and half would be placed on the other side. Then the two parties involved in the covenant will hold hands and then together they will walk through this passage. And that is the symbolical uh, act that they have agreed on all terms for this uh, covenant, of this covenant. And if anyone should be breaking or not keeping to this covenant, that person will be answerable. But in Genesis 15, uh, Abraham was so busy preparing the thing and then fending off all the, all the disturbances that came during the day. By evening, he was so tired, he slept. And the next time he, he woke up, by then uh, God had already walked through the, 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 the thing himself and the covenant was sealed. So it was God who made the covenant. 
with Abraham and for Abraham. And so, what did Abraham do? Nothing. Nothing. It was grace, purely by grace. His covenant with Abraham was all of grace because Abraham was in a deep sleep when the covenant was established. Next, when God delivered Israel from Egypt, it was on the basis of grace and not law, for the law had not yet been given. They, they, they were really you know, in, in a difficult time in, in Egypt because the Egyptian rulers, the pharaohs and so on, they did not remember uh, uh, Joseph. And so they inflicted harsh times on the people of Israel. And so the people of Israel cried out to God. God heard them and God sent a deliverer in the person of Moses and delivered them. So they crossed the Red Sea and they went to, to, into the wilderness. They went to Mount Sinai. And then the law was given at Mount Sinai. So what was there for them? Nothing. It was purely by grace. Not that they did wonderfully well in Egypt, but by His grace, He delivered them into, uh, I mean, out of Egypt. So, you had grace, and then you had the law at Mount Sinai, and 1,500 years later, the law still could not produce any righteous person. And then Jesus came in fulfillment of the word, and then you have grace, right? So, this is uh, the long and the short of what we are trying to cover in the last lesson and also this lesson. And so, if you look, if you look at the outline for this uh, chapter 4, the sons and the heirs, the fears for the church, and then the two covenants. And Father God, we are just so grateful and thankful to you for the new covenant, the covenant of grace. Lord, we on our own will never attain to the full requirements of the law. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for providing this and making it possible for us to be redeemed and to be reconciled with you. So I pray, dear Lord, that you will continue to enable us to walk righteously before you and to be like Paul, to remember and to enjoy and to treasure our freedom in Christ Jesus and never to be back in bondage again. This is our prayer. We ask that you will help us in this. In Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen.